Hello, I'm Daniel Benjamin. I am the president of the American Academy in Berlin, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this year's Ellen Maria Gorson lecture on translation as storytelling, which will be presented by Professor Susan Bernofsky, who is um, our fall uh, 2020 uh, Ellen Maria Gorson Fellow here at the American Academy. This fellowship was established in 2001 by uh, the Anna Maria and Stephen Kellen Foundation and the descendants of Hans and Ludmilla Arnold, who also provided the founding gifts for the American Academy in Berlin and remain the Academy's most generous benefactor. Uh, Ellen Maria Gorison um, was one of Hans Arnold's uh, daughters, and so this is uh, a lecture that is uh, very close to all of our hearts. Uh, let me just add that we've had an awful lot of discussion about the election, uh, about COVID, about uh, foreign policy, and uh, I'm clearly not the only one who is delighted to be uh, moving off to the high plains of literature right now because we've had a remarkable uh, sign up for this event, and I'm delighted to see that we also have a huge number of people who are, who are participating. Um, before I turn it over to our speaker, let me just give a brief introduction uh, of her discussant tonight, uh, Veronica Fuschner, uh, will introduce Susan and then we'll uh, join with her in a, um, in a Q and A session. Uh, for me, this is a particular pleasure because Veronica has been a colleague of mine for many years, well before I came to the uh, American Academy. Um, she is uh, associate professor and the recently finished chair of the German studies department. I hope I have that right, Veronica at Dartmouth College, where she also teaches comparative literature, Jewish studies, and women and gender studies. She holds an appointment as an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Medical Education at the Geisel School of Medicine. Uh, she earned her PhD at the University of Chicago and began her studies um, at uh, the University of Marburg and the Freie Universität here in Berlin. She is the author of Berlin Psychoanalytic, Psychoanalysis and Culture in Weimar uh, Republic Germany and Beyond, and uh, has been the co-editor of a number of other volumes. Her work has been supported by a number of foundations and institutions, and I'm proud to say most recently, the American Academy of Berlin, where she was the Anna Maria Kellen Fellow uh, in uh, the spring of this year. Uh, Professor Fuchner and her family um, uh, have stayed on in Berlin, uh, and uh, she is a, uh, a veteran of the lockdown that we had here uh, in the spring. Um, but I think before that happened, she did manage to get in her lecture on uh, Thomas Mann's Brazilian mother and on Mann's construction of Germanness and race. And uh, I am told that it was a terrific lecture. I was not yet here. So before I hand it over to Veronica, let me just tell you that uh, we will have uh, audience participation in the Q&A uh, after uh, the initial talk and some back and forth. Uh, do not hit the uh, raise hand function um, because it will not make any difference. Uh, we are taking questions in the Q&A uh, box. You can find the icon at the bottom of your Zoom frame. Uh, enter your questions there and I'm sure Veronica will get to as many of them as she possibly can. So Veronica, it's lovely to see you with that great backdrop and I'm turning it over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Dan. And it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Professor Susan Bernofsky. She is an Associate Professor of Writing at Columbia University and Director of the Translation Program at Columbia University School of the Arts. She holds a BA from John Hopkins University and NF MFA in Fiction from Washington University in St. Louis and a PhD in comparative literature um, from Princeton University. Before coming to Columbia, she taught at Bard College, Sarah Lawrence College, and Queens College. Susan is a rare intellectual who can think and write in many different veins and venues. She's a scholar, an essayist, and a translator of more than 20 books. Among others, she has translated The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka, Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse, and the opera libretto of Mozart's Magic Flute. She's not only interested in the modernist German tradition, but also has translated contemporary authors, such as Jenny Erpenbeck, Yoko Tawada, and Uliana Wolf. 
Some of these authors are particularly challenging to translate as they experiment with language or even with several languages at once, as in the case of Yoko Tawada. Susan's work has therefore been recognized with many awards, including the Helen and Kurt Wolf Translation Prize, the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize, the Hermann Hesse Translation Prize, the Oxford Weidenfeld Translation Prize, and the Lewis Roth Award of the Modern Language Association, and I'm not even naming all of them here. She has also held many prestigious fellowships. She was a Guggenheim Fellow, a Fellow of the American Council of Learned Societies, the Penn Translation Fund, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Leon Levy Center of Biography at the CUNY Graduate Center, and the Lennon Foundation. Susan has been a tireless ambassador at large for the theory and practice of translation in the US. As director of Columbia University's translation program, she has had an enormous impact on the next generation of translators and on bringing new literary voices from everywhere into the English speaking world. Recent alumni of Susan's program have translated literature from many languages, Mongol, Tibetan, Spanish, Hebrew, Yiddish, and of course, German. Susan is a former chair of the translation committee of the Pan American Center and also served on the board of the American Literary Translators Association. For more than 10 years, Susan ran a popular blog about translation in which she proved herself a real mentor to other translators by posting advice on how to craft translations and most importantly, how to get them published. You can also follow Susan on Twitter where she tweets about books and politics and how all of that translates into real life under the handle Translationista. Susan is the editor of the book In Translation, Translators on Their Work and What It Means, together with Esther Allen. And that's a collection of essays by many well-known authors, scholars, translators, such as the novelist Haruki Murakami, that discusses the concerns and challenges of translation in the age of globalization. Susan has also explored the historical origins of her field with her study, Foreign Words, Translator Authors in the Age of Goethe. In this book, she lucidly narrates how much translation practice and theory were part of any serious intellectual endeavor in the 18th and early 19th century. Goethe, Humboldt, Kleist, to name just a few, all thought about and practiced translation, and it fundamentally shaped their aesthetics and politics. But no other author, at least until now, has held Susan's attention as much as the Swiss-German modernist author Robert Walser. After introducing him to the English reading public by translating eight of his works, including Berlin stories and looking at pictures, Susan is about to publish his biography titled Clairvoyant of the Small, the Life of Robert Walser. Um, it's forthcoming with Yale University Press next spring. And it promises to bring much overdue attention to Walser, whose prose and eccentric life inspired many writers like Kafka, Walter Benjamin, and W.G. Sebald. As we will hear, Susan is currently working on a new translation of Thomas Mann's 1924 novel, Magic Mountain. And we can already discern that she is approaching this Herculean task with her well-calibrated mixture of academic rigor, poetic playfulness, and lastly, a good dose of humor. Writing about Mann's famous writing blocks and complaints about the blank page in front of him, Susan quips, by July 1913, at the latest, still procrastinating the novel Confessions of Felix Kroll, and I should add that that novel was not finished, ever, <laughs> Mann sat down to quickly write this funny little story set in Davos. Guess how that went? Please, please, please let my translation of the novel go more quickly. We can only hope the same, Susan, as your translation will certainly find new resonances in a world that has changed so dramatically in the last few months and finds us today adjusting to the prospect of entering a new period of social isolation. So today, really, Monday, um, due to a highly contagious lung disease. So, but I will let you speak now and um, explore these contemporary resonances for us. Wow, thank you so much, Veronica, for that incredibly beautiful introduction and also for our conversations about Man and the world that I've been very much enjoying and learning from these last few weeks. And thank you to the entire incredible staff of the American Academy in Berlin and Daniel Benjamin. I've, 
really appreciate your support so much. I'm so grateful to be here, even if only in pixel form. Speaking of which, I now have to try and do a screen share, which, hold your breath, everybody. Screen share is happening, is happening, I hope. My main point today is simple. Translating is always a, a sort of storytelling. It's a way of giving an account of something you've read in another language, and now you're doing all the voices as you sit around the campfire. A literary translation is your account of what you found in something you've read. This is structural, it's inevitable in literary translation of every sort, but it becomes doubly true in the case of retranslations, particularly in the retranslations of classic texts that already exist in several versions in the language in question. I've retranslated a couple of classic texts before this year, Hermann Hesse's Siddhartha and Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis, if you've heard. And in each case, I thought hard in advance about what sort of story I have to tell, had to tell about these works. And in particular, what stories I thought previous translators hadn't told in the same way I would. In the case of Siddhartha, my story had to do with a state of grace as expressed in extreme lyricism. Hesse was a gifted prose stylist whose sentences in German are almost aggressively melodic, even cloying in their lushness, heavy on the assonance and so forth. And in the case of his book, Siddhartha, I felt that this work, the, the, that this was work his prose needed to be doing to make the case for the vision of the world he was presenting to us in the immediate aftermath of what at the time was called the Great War which had devastated Europe with unprecedented violence, killing millions with modern technology. Hesse started the novel in 1919, finished it in 20, 1922. So at a moment when so many of the young men of Europe were dead or wounded, Hesse wrote a fantasy about a young man with all the time in the world to search for his true calling. And the prose that goes along with this project sentences with a flowing melody held together with assonance represents in this book the state of nirvana of a universe in balance everything is about the harmonious sense of balance dignified pacing so here's a glimpse at my translation of that book it's the turning point scene in, wh in which siddhartha decides to kill himself after living the too much of a life of luxury and then he finds inspiration to turn his life around and seek enlightenment. And I'll read a little bit. Above the river bank, a tree grew a slant, a coconut palm, and against its trunk, Siddhartha rested his shoulder, placing his arm around the tree and gazing down into the green water that flowed on and on beneath him, gazed down and found himself utterly overwhelmed by the desire to let go and sink beneath its surface. A terrible emptiness was reflected back at him from beneath the water and found its reply in the awful emptiness within his soul. He'd reached an impasse. All that was left for him to do now was to annihilate himself, smash to pieces the botched structure of his life, throw it away, hurl it at the feet of the mocking gods. This was the great purging he had longed for, death, the smashing of the form he so despised. Let the fish devour him, this dog, Siddhartha, this madman, this spoiled and rotten body, this sagging and abused soul. Let the fish and crocodiles devour him. Let demons tear him to pieces. With a grimace, he peered into the water, saw his, fa his face mirrored there and spat at it. Feeling profound weariness, he released his arm from around the tree trunk and rotated his body a little so as to let himself fall vertically, sink at last into the depths. With closed eyes, he sank towards death. Then, from distant reaches of his soul, from, from, from bygone realms of his weary life, a sound fluttered. So, to give you an idea, here are some other ways this scene might sound. I'm giving you just one sentence in several translations for comparison with the German down below. I'm not gonna read all these. I'll just let you look at them for a moment and get a sense of all the great variety of approaches there can be. Um, even if you just look at the, the word 
vomiting um, here, um, das große Erbrechen, which I translated as purging, the purging he had longed for. Um, you know, here it is in one, in one case as emesis, which is a sort of more technical term, vomiting, the great vomiting, the great retching. Um, in the case of the Hilda Rossner translation, which is the first one that I read as, as a young person, as a great enthusiast of that novel, um, the word is elided, it's not there at all. She writes, that was the deed which he longed to commit which may not have been her choice. It may well have been an editing decision. You know, back in 1951, it was less likely that a translator would have f final decision-making over, the, over their translation. There were many more changes in editing that a translator would just have to, have to succumb to, as it were. Um, so there's that. I'm gonna show you one more point of this book. Um, and this is the book's last line. The last, for the last lines. I wanted to hit my point home about the book, the sense of finding peace, finding harmony that as expressed in Hesse's language, because this is a book that has a happy ending, Siddhartha finds enlightenment. In my translation, you'll see if you compare the German with English, those of you who read German, I rearranged things a little bit and I changed some things around. If you look at the last sentence, you'll see that I end somewhere different on the word holy. Um, I didn't want the last lines of my book to be, you know, as in the German, well, the German has had been as the last line, which is kind of invisible in German. In German, you hear alles, was ihm wert und heilig gewesen war, and the wert und heilig really stands out. The gewesen war is almost invisible in German. But in English, it would have been very likely to wind up on the words to him as the last words, and I didn't want the book to end there. I wanted to end on holy, and so I did a little bit of rearranging. I also, re I also added some repetitions. I wanted there to be a sense of gravitas which to me is achieved by forcing the reader to go a little slower. And so I retook the verb, the verb verneigte, bowed, which verneigte is three syllables in German, but only one in English. So the T verneigte as ich bis zur Erde, which takes a moment to, to read, is in, in my English, deeply he bowed, bowed to the very earth. And I put a very in there also to make it a little more emphatic and to give the sense of gravitas. You'll see also there's a chiasmus in the German, which I have put in bold. It would have been kind of corny in, in, in English, I think, in his life ever, it would have been. Um, and so I use a repetition, simple, a simple repetition here um, of the everything he had ever loved in all his life ever in all his life gets repeated. And so this is my attempt to tell this bit of the story at the end of Hesse's novel Siddhartha. Okay, let's talk about Kafka. Ready to change gears? For Kafka's metamorphosis, the story I was telling about Kafka's story is that Gregor Samsa is a hysterical drama queen. The story is a comedy, admittedly a very, very dark comedy. The joke is always on him. So it's kind of the opposite of, of Hesse's book, really, written around the same period a few years before. Kafka's humor is situational deadpan, although Kafka's was written before the war, which, you know, that's a difference, important difference. The story's humor comes from a, a powerful disconnect between Gregor Samsa's frantic attempts to do the right thing at all times, he's a company man par excellence, and his grotesque physical state, which makes him impossible, makes it impossible for him to do his job. He's a parody of dutifulness. And it's funnier because we sense that in some spiritual sense, he's brought this curse down upon his own head by his own pathological obedience, which is extreme to the point of its absurdity. If you think about it, he wakes up, he finds out that he's stuck in a different body. And instead of thinking, oh my God, I'm stuck in a different body, he thinks, oh my God, I'm gonna be late for work. It's crazy, crazy talk. Um, it's funny. And in my opinion, the funniest part of the story is the part where his father pulls out a safe and looks, oh, pulls out all the, the family papers and starts going through the papers and realize that 
we realize what, what the, the father has no doubt known all along is that the family was never in debt. They had plenty of money all the time. There was never any reason for their son, their dutiful son, to work himself to the bone to repay these ancestral debts. You know, he's, he's, he's been a massive fool. The universal joke is on him. Ha, ha, ha. You know, you feel sorry for him and bad for him at the same time. So everywhere in this translation, I worked to make the melodrama as clear and obvious as I could, looking for deadpan humor wherever I could in the form of overly formal language to play off the contrast with his gross, his grotesque body. Um, so just a couple of couple of lines. So here's, here's a line where he's eating moldy food and thinking, might I be less fastidious than before? And the might I be less fastidious are very precise enunciation. Um, it's funny. He's eating rotting food as he's saying these lines. Um, here's another one. Um, Gregor realized he could not possibly allow the general manager um, Somebody from work, because he's late from work, has come to check up on him to see why he's late. It's absurd. Um, he realized he could not possibly allow the general manager to depart in his present frame of mind if his own position at the firm was not to be put in the gravest jeopardy. So gravest jeopardy are also my attempt to find that tone um, of extreme formality, which is grotesque. Um, and one last example. Here's the end of that first, the first act of the story where the father has chased monstrous Gregor back into the room, thrust, shuts the door on him. It's a violent scene. It's a frightening scene. And in English, it was going by too quickly and undramatically. The word, it's, it's in a sense, the words didn't have enough syllables to capture the drama and melodrama of this. Um, and so I, I, did something that I sometimes do is translate a word more than once to slow it down a little bit and to allow for the melodrama. So I'll read the German and the English in this case. Da gab ihm der Vater von hinten einen jetzt wahrhaftig erlösenden starken Stoß. The father's trying to get him to go through a doorway in which he cannot fit because his body is too large. So he gets shoved forcibly through this too narrow door. It's very violent. Um, my English. Then his father administered a powerful shove from behind, a genuinely liberating thrust. So the word shos has a sexual connotation. It's the word push or shove. It's also the word thrust. I wanted to have it both ways, so I took advantage of this moment where I wanted to inflate the drama of by uh, translating it both ways. Um, drawing out this moment of horror. Um, and so that's my, that's my, my, my story of melodrama in Kafka. Okay, moving right along. Um, it's Magic Mountain time. Magic Mountain time coming to you live from Morningside Mountain in Manhattan. Um, here's a truly monolithic work of German literature. It's going to take me a little while to decide exactly what stories I am telling in my translation of this book. But the first thing that I'm working with is I have the idea that this huge novel is one big inflated fairy tale, as suggested by a remark made in passing in the book's prologue, the last line on the screen here. And there are a number of points where my treatment of the language can reflect this reading. So to give you an example, one of the first big translation problems in the Magic Mountain that I've spent a lot of time puzzling over, although I think I'm done with that now, thank God, is the translation of the simple little word einfach, literally simple, that appears both in the first line of the prologue and in the first line of chapter one. In both cases, it's used as part of the unit, ein einfacher junger Mensch, literally a simple young person. Here's the, the opening of chapter one where you'll find it also. And in my first draft of the translation, I wrote simple young person, and then went about trying to find a better word to replace that simple with, since after all, surely the protagonist of Thomas Mann's great novel isn't a simpleton. 
I ticked through a number of possible synonyms, regular, ordinary, et cetera. My partner, Richard, even suggested the 21st century equivalent basic, which I love, basic young person. I settled on unremarkable, which I find a very appealing word that fits with the arched eyebrow, we're both in on the joke here, ironic tone that Mon is cultivating. But then I started thinking about it more. In what sense is young Hans Kostrup unremarkable? He's not an average sort of person. The first thing we learn about him is that he's rich or at least wealth adjacent. We see him carrying a traveling bag fashioned of pricey and exotic crocodile skin that as we're immediately informed was given to him by a consul with a fancy sounding name and title who's both his uncle and foster father. Clearly his family story is anything but simple. Of course, the word might well be meant ironically, but does Mann really expect us to be reading in high gear irony mode already by the second word of chapter one? Well, maybe he does. But I started to hunt around in period dictionaries to learn how the words einfach and simple were being used early in the 20th century. And lo and behold, both words were often understood first subheading in their dictionary definitions to mean guileless or artless. In other words, innocent. And this makes sense. Isn't Magic Mountain the story of an unsuspecting young person who got on a train to pay a three week visit, cue the theme song of Gilligan's Island, and got more than he bargained for? I really do think this is the story Mon is telling. And then there's a bit in the prologue where the narrator coyly points out that there's something of the fairy tale in the book he's presented. So what if the translation of Einfach really were just literally simple? Don't many fairy tales start out with a simple young man setting out on a journey? And if the secondary meaning not so clever creeps in as well, what's the harm? Continuing to ponder, I remembered Emily Wilson's brilliant analysis of the opening line of Homer's Odyssey that prompted her to describe Odysseus as a complicated man. She notes the etymological derivation of this English word from the Latin plicare, to fold. So Odysseus is both many layered, think of a cloth folded over on itself, and the one who has journeyed hither and yon many turnings in his past. He is pleaded with pleats, the calm and plea of complicated. And it turns out that the pla of simple comes from placare as well. Sim signifies self-same, self i.e. one. So the simple is that which has only a single turning or fold. Technically, you might object the simple ought to be without folds, just as complicated as with them, or to use a different sort of example, shouldn't that excellent product we refer to as two-ply toilet paper actually be called one-ply? So at a certain point, the word designating a fold came to mean a layer as well, making simple the clear opposite of complicated, which also makes it a not bad metaphorical equivalent for the German einfach, which literally means one compartment. I'm still at the beginning of my Magic Mountain explorations, but for now, I'm going to call the fellow a simple young man. As I work, I keep finding spots in the book where my idea about the importance of fairy tale and Mon's story guides my translation. For example, the house in which Hans Kastrup spends most of his early childhood is described as in einer trüben Wetterfarbe gestrichen. In an early draft of the translation, I wrote, painted a glaucous hue, thinking that the weather in Hamburg, as man describes it, is often gloomy and gray, like New York today. Although the word glaucous can also mean a pale green yellow color as well as blue gray, so that's potentially confusing. But then I started thinking harder, harder about the word wetterfarbe, weather color. It's a strange word, right? And I started looking for it in my various dictionaries, including the ye olde ones, and finding it nowhere. But I did eventually find it somewhere in an anonymous 19th century translation of Charles Perrault's fairy tale, Po Dan, Donkey Skin. This is the very story that the Brothers Grimm famously reworked under the title Allerlei Rau, all sorts of furs, which literary scholars love to write about 
but the word doesn't appear in the Grimm's version of the story. In the Perrault tale, a girl threatened with incest, her dad wants to marry her, tries to save herself by inventing trials for him. And the first is to challenge him to bring her a dress the color of the weather. Oh, there's the, there's the cover page. And there's the color of the weather. I'm guessing that Mon read this story as a child and the fairy tale color stuck with him. And so the house in my translation is currently described as somberly painted the color of the weather. Of course, it's especially poignant that the French word for weather also means time, bringing us back to yet another of Mon's obsessions. Should I honor it by describing the house as somberly painted the color of time? Um, I think I'm not gonna do that. There's a second area in which I'm looking to shape my translation, and that's through a really precise accounting of details, of the, of the details of the book's cultural artifacts. Ironically, this is easier for me than for either of the book's previous translators because of the internet and 21st century library access. Helen Lowe Porter translated the book soon after it appeared and had access to Thomas Mann himself though I don't think he was very interested in explaining every deal, detail of every reference to her. And the great John E. Woods, who translated the book 70 years later in the mid 1990s, but without the kind of internet we have today, um, came up with something that was incredibly detail oriented, which I applaud as well as really funny, which ditto, I love his translation. But in this instance, Let's say, I'm just, hmm, let me retake this. But for instance, I'm just working on a passage set during Hans Kastorp's adolescence where he visits the Hamburg dockyards, which Mann describes in a sweeping panor panorama that contrasts the labor of working men with the relative leisure enjoyed by people of Kastorp's social class. The scene is full of very technical shipyard technology, which is a nightmare for the translator. Or by nightmare, I mean challenge. We love challenges. Um, and just yesterday, I was working to track down a good translation for the word Lenz Tafel. Now, if this were a live talk, I'd ask people in the audience to raise their hands. Have you ever heard this word before? A lens tafel is the schematic plan of the system of pipes and pumps for keeping the inside of the keel of a big wooden ship free of water. It's connected to the word lens pumpa from the Dutch word lens pump, bilge pump, lens, from lens meaning empty, free. The verb lens, lens and in German, leer, it means leer pumpen. Um, it's 19th century maritime usage, Seemannsprache for to pump a ship empty of water. Um, so the word Lenztafel is the problem. Woods has pump chart, which proves that it was possible to find out, find out a lot of really arcane things even before the heyday of the internet. There's lots of sweat equity research in his translation of the book. Helen Lowe Porter in, in 1927 writes loading scale. And that means that she gave up too easily in the face of a word that wasn't in her dictionary, or she wrote something weird that her editors disagreed with and changed to this. In a sense, it's not loading scale. It's wrong, but it's not horrendous as a makeshift translation because the thing she picked does fit in with the panorama of the shipyard that she's describing, even though I'm not even sure what a loading scale is. It's certainly not handheld and it's being described in the scene as handheld. But the most important thing she's missing here is a chance to show off the book's deep structure. Mann is exceptionally attentive to detail and to what back when I was starting my studies might have been called objective correlatives, although now I think they're referred to instead in terms of metonymy, which if you ask me about it, you'll get some comic relief. Um, don't do it. Um, but my point is that the book is exceptionally rich in seemingly random details that in fact profoundly reflect the book's concerns and deep structure. Mann could have picked so many other and different details to show us this busy harbor scene, but his choice here invites us to consider the existence of the bilge pump. This is an item that fills any thinking person with existential dread. 
It's a reminder that the ship you're sailing on, especially in the 19th century and before, is always at every moment sinking. Only the constant vigilant working of the pumps is keeping us afloat, kind of like our lungs, which reliably fill with air every few seconds until maybe they don't. So that's a pandemic thought that tragically is just as relevant in 2020 as it was in 1918. Also relevant in the life of Hans Kastorp, enthusiastic embracer of the tuberculosis lifestyle. And so an important part of a translator's storytelling is being very aware of the sort of storytelling the writer in question is doing and the gambits they use for this, both in macrocosm and microcosm. It helps to have some Virgo in your astrological chart. So for now, I think I've told enough stories about my approach to storytelling and my translation in progress of Mann's novel. I promised at, when, I, when I agreed to do this talk that I would end by reading a little bit of my translation. So I've, I've picked a page from chapter two, which is the nostalgia chapter. Very difficult to translate because the language is very, very dense and knotted. Not so much forward action, lots of retrospect and incredibly intricate sentences. I'm going to read you a brief description of something called a baptismal bowl, which young Hans Kastorp asks to be shown and with great ceremony it's unwrapped and unpackaged from a room inside a house. There's lots of, ins lots of packaging in this novel and nesting of things inside other things. And this is the bowl with which he himself was baptized as a baby. So here is my description or Mann's description, my translation. <clears throat> the bowl and plate were not originally a set, as one could see and as the, bo the boy now heard, not for the first time. But the two had been used together, his grandfather said, for around 100 years, ever since the bowl's acquisition. It was a beautiful bowl, simple and elegant in form, shaped by the austere tastes of the dawn of the previous century. Polished, smooth, and of the finest quality, it had a round base and gilded interior, now time-worn and faded to a yellow sheen. The, books, uh, the bowl's sole ornamentation was an embossed wreath of roses with serrated leaves around the upper rim. As for the plate, it was significantly older, as could be read in its interior, where 1650 was engraved in elaborate numerals, encircled by curlicues in what, in what then counted as the modern style, frivolously florid, with a coat of arms and arabesques that were half flower, half star. On the back of the plate, the names of its successive owners had been stippled in various scripts. There were seven names so far, each with the date of inheritance, and the old man in the cravat used his beringed index finger to direct his grandson's attention to each entry in turn. The name of the boy's father was inscribed there, along with his grandfather and great-grandfather, after which the prefix ur, great, began to double, triple, and quadruple on his grandfather's tongue. And the boy's head listed to one side, his eyes fixed in pensive or absent-minded abandon, and his mouth reverently slumbering as he listened to this oor, 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 a sound so dark it seemed to emanate from the crypt, from the very tomb of time and to express a piously upheld connection between the present day, his own life, and the deepest past, making a most peculiar impression on him as the look on his face revealed. Hearing this sound, he felt he was inhaling the musty chill that lingered in St. Catherine's Church and the crypt beneath St. Michael's, the effluvia of sights so hallowed that you involuntarily, your hat in your hands, adopt a reverential gait, swaying as you advance without letting the heels of your boots touch the ground. And he sensed his ears filling with the remote, cloistered silence of these echoing halls, religious sentiments commingled with intimations of death 
and history as this muffled syllable resounded. And all of this somehow soothed him. Indeed, it was perhaps only for the sake of this sound to be able to hear it and hear himself repeating it back again that he'd been asked to, sh asked to be, sh that he'd asked to be shown the baptismal bowl. So I'll stop here. I do have a second passage that I can read if we wound it, wind up having a bit extra time. And this one's a little funnier, but before, but rather than risk cutting too much into our discussion time, I think I'll, I'll pause for now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, this was really beautiful uh, also to hear um, some of the language of, of your translation. And um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. And um, we already have uh, quite a few questions from the audience. So I'm going to uh, move to that too. And just um, please type your um, questions in the, in the Q&A box. Um, I won't be able to read all the questions, but uh, and I also won't be able to to say the name of the person who's asking the question um, so that you know um, for privacy reasons. Um, so I'll start out with um, your take on the magic mountain as a fairy tale. And I think you, you really, especially in the last uh, part, it became very beautifully clear how, how all these fairy tale, the fairy tale ambience resonates in, in that description. Um, and there's a certain uncanniness, a certain uh, um, sense of history, tradition, and so on, um, the language. And I'm, I'm thinking also of um, the violence and the horror that is in fairy tales, right? They're just incredibly, incredibly violent. And I'm wondering if, if that is something that you're thinking about in mediating that language, that there is this kind of uh, violence underneath um, the these, this language. Yeah, I think I think a lot of the violence comes in actually in his descriptions of illness. And I didn't I didn't pick any of those bits to read, but when Thomas Mann describes the effect that tuberculosis has on the body, I think we really do feel not only uh, not only violence but also the role of the spectator of violence and there's almost a certain luxuriating in it which is a little uncomfortable for me you know and having talked about you know the role of the war in hesse's book novel in particular um which hesse brackets out very explicitly thomas mann also brackets out the war, even though the war took place during his writing of the book. You know, so, you know, that's to be noted also. He saves it until the end and, you know, we have a little, a brief panorama, a very like long distance view of the very beginning of the war with Hans Kastorp marching off into, into battle, you know, and <laughs> finally, you know, the war finishes the job that, the, that tuberculosis didn't didn't right. finish for him, but you know, in a way that's it's deflected. Right, and there's a, there's a sense of doom, right, right from the beginning. I mean, as he kind of sleeps in the bed of a dead person and all, all of that. I mean, that, that comes through. Yeah, um, yeah. I, from, I was, from the very uh, the very moment that everything. Right, I, I was wondering. One. So. Um, I mean, you know, translation is, is telling a story about a book, but is also telling a story about an author. And so you've done yeah. this Robert Balza a lot, you know, that you mediated also the figure of an author to an American audience. And um, with Thomas Mann, that's, um, that's complicated because he's also an author in America, right? He wasn't just an author in Germany, but also an author in the US. And so how, how does your translation tell a story about Mann? Yeah, you know, in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking much more about his early life. His America story was much later. The Mann who wrote The Magic Mountain was not the Mann of the United States. That would be a later Mann, and I'm interested in the Mann in the United States. But for now, thinking specifically about this book, I'm thinking more about how he got there. And some important factors about this were, you know, his wife's illness with lung disease that caused him to visit 
a sanatorium in, in 1912 and spend some time there, which provided the first seed of this novel, but also his struggle after his great first novel, Buddenbrooks, which made him extremely famous when he was very young. Um, and then, you know, he sp spent really a couple of decades trying to write another book that would match the reputation that he had acquired with that book. And, you know, it, The Magic Mountain, you know, in retrospect for us was that book, but also keep in mind, he got the Nobel Prize, you know, five years after writing The Magic Mountain, he got the Nobel Prize specifically for Buddenbrooks. So, you know, poor Zauberberg. Right. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's, that's a story worth telling. <laughs> I'm going to uh, include some questions from the audience because there's quite, quite a few questions and I want us to get um, to some of them. Um, uh, there is a question by someone who also translates and um, was wondering about how, uh, how much one should make the audience feel etymological echoes um, because they might get lost. I mean, he um, this person um, talks about the Emily Wilson example that you gave and, you know, isn't that something that's really, uh, you know, for the experts and then when you actually read a translation that just doesn't, you know, <laughs> doesn't come yeah. across. So what's the balance here? Well, the translator, the translator by definition, is a person who spends a lot of time doing things that will not be noticed. Like, you know, you probably did not notice in the example from Hesse Siddhartha that I showed earlier that I used the word aslant, which, you know, I took from the Ophelia drowning scene of, of Hamlet, which is a scene that I felt resonated with, you know, Siddhartha's moment of despair and wanting to drown himself. It's my own private thought, but, you know, I've, I've built up my own Siddhartha that references Hamlet at that point in a way that is invisible. Nobody's going to notice that except me. And nobody is going, nobody reading the word simple is going to be thinking about etymology, but the etymology of that word does affect the way that word has, gen has, has journeyed through the centuries to come to where it is here for us now. And that history does, I think, affect the way the word is used and felt. You know, we don't usually think about etymology as we speak, but the way that we use words is to a large extent still influenced by even etymologies we don't know. So yeah, I do not expect the reader to be thinking about that at all ever. But I, I think and hope that my thinking about etymology will help create the response in the reader's heart that I'm hoping for. Yeah, that's um, maybe another question um, from another translator um, that ties into this, this question of etymology um, is a question of anachronism. And um, so, you know, how, how do you feel about um, using words that were actually not used at the time, right? I mean, so how, how do you deal with that question? Yeah. So this is a hobby horse of mine, and I've written about this, and I, I think about this a lot in a way that will also be invisible, I hope and I think, to readers of the translation. I really try to avoid using words that were not in use in English at the time the work was written in German. And again, most people will not notice, I mean, some cases, you know, they wouldn't notice, for example, there, there was some Robert Walzer piece where I really, really, really wanted to use the word brinksmanship because it well described the power struggle being, being described in that passage. But, you know, it's, it's a word from much later and from a completely different historical context. So I didn't do it. You know, occasionally I'll break that rule. But I, this is a technique that I, I started you, you following when I, when I was asked by Lawrence Venuti to do a quote Schleiermachian 
unquote, translation of Friedrich Schleiermacher's essay about translating for the early 19th century. And so I set about trying to avoid words that were not also in use in that meaning in English around 1800, which disqualified a lot of words, such as the word text, for example. Um, but then it started to seem to me useful in creating a sort of faux period atmosphere. It's not like you're going to read one of my translations and think, oh, you know, this was clearly written around 1900 or whatever the year. But I, I think that there's something jarring about neologisms. And so it's my own particular hobby horse to steer away from them. There are approaches to translation that make very active, explicit use of new language, new words, and there is absolutely a place for that. I would never argue that, but I myself want to, the, the sort of practice uh, that I have as a translator is different from that. Verschiedenes is gut, as Hölderlin teaches us. And some of the, the questions that are coming in from the audience here um, actually concern um, sound and combination of words. Mm -hmm. And also um, what you described, your practice of slowing down. Um, so as you translate into the English, kind of taking the rhythm of the German language and, and including repetition. Um, so taking the liberty to do that. So how, how much of a role does sound also play for you, sound and rhythm? Can you expand on that a little more? Yeah, so this is huge. And, you know, when you translate you from a language over years, you develop a feeling for the relationship of the language pair that you are, are dealing with. And when you translate from German to English, the texts in English tend to become a proxy approximately 15% longer in terms of word count, but shorter in, ter in terms of page length and also syllable length. German has bigger, longer words, and it has more words that express more things. So semantically, functionally, English, you often need more words, but I often find that pacing, if I do just a semantically oriented translation where each word, you know, is translated as efficiently as possible into English, that the thing goes by too fast in English. And if you read a lot of writing in English, you'll find that English language writers approach pacing in their sentences, rhythm, storytelling, pacing, rhetorical gestures in a different way from writers who write in German. And it's very important to be aware of that. And also, you know, if you're translating in English, to read a lot that was written first in English, written, writing written originally in English, to, to stay very aware of how storytelling works in English and what your options are. Because, you know, the notion that we want to be very word for word oriented in our translations can really lead to such a different sound quality that results in a different sort of story. And of course, every language has different sound patterns. You have to be thinking about, you know, what are my resources in English? What are the strengths and beauties of the English language? English is very rich in verbs. You know, German has more verbs technically when you tack on all the prefixes and suffixes, but just in terms of, of the pure, you know, the hardcore inner verbs, English is very, very rich. And, you know, that's a place that we can add color to a sentence and also change the sound. So, you know, I think of, I think of my thesaurus kind of as my Bible. Oh, it's out of reach or I grab it. Um, I make very heavy use of the thesaurus and I spend as much time looking in different English language dictionaries, including the Oxford English Dictionary, which the online version tells you when exactly a word became came to be in use in a specific shade of meaning by year. And it has a, a historical thesaurus sorted by year, which is great if you're approaching translation the way I do. So use all your tools, always. 
as you're using these tools um, in the English language, um, there's a question also concerning um, tools in other languages. So do you consult um, for your translation uh, translations into other languages or other other dictionaries of other languages. So that's that's one of the questions that deals with language. But then also um, there are a couple of questions that deal with the multilinguality of the text of Thomas Mann's text. So that you have French and um, other languages in there. So how how does that factor into your translation? Oh my God, that's like half an hour worth of questions. Okay, I'm gonna first. This <laughs> no, happens to me. Show you my. This is my favorite tool. Um, this is a turn of the 20th century dictionary that I inherited from my uncle John Garrett, who was born in Danzig, when it, Gdansk, when it was Danzig. Um, and he left me a set of bilingual dictionaries from the turn of the 20th century. And it's one of the most important tools I own, not only because it contains words that might not be contained in modern day German to English dictionaries, including online ones, but also the English terms that were most in use at that time, which are different from the ones now. I make a lot of use of historical because this is a you know a hundred year old work. I make a lot of use of older German language dictionaries. Some of them are available, they've been scanned and you can you know, access them online. Um, I have in the past had occasion to look for, at, for example, like a, a German to French dictionary to, to help me think about different approaches to a German word I was having trouble getting, getting a grip on. So I think using reference works widely is incredibly, incredibly helpful. Um, and the older translation, so here, here's a case where I'm translating a book that has two really excellent older translations. And I do occasionally look at them, but I try not to look at them much because it can be a trap. Um, I'm trying very hard to think about my vision of Mann's book. And I don't want to start second guessing myself and confusing myself. You know, um, Johnny Woods is a translator that I hugely admire. He's also a friend. I adore him as a person. And he is so artful and careful as a work, you know, as a, a working translator. Um, but he has a different ear from me. He has a somewhat different approach. And I want to not distract myself with his vision of the book, which I already admire. Um, and therefore could be distracted by. So, you know, it, for purposes of this talk, I looked to see what he had done and what Helen, what Helen Lowe Porter had done for, you know, the, the examples that I was going to put into this talk, um, just to know what they are. But when I'm working, I, as a rule, stay away from, from these. The first book that I retranslated was Hesse Siddhartha, and I was well ahead of the deadline, so I had a chance to look at the other translations before I turned in my translation, and I had kept a list of all the, the spots I'd really struggled with to, you know, to see if I could get help from any, any of the other translators. And what I discovered, without exception, looking at their renderings of those passages that I had struggled with was that they had struggled too in those spots. And, you know, each of us had fudged it in a different way. So, okay, it's not that I'm missing something. This is just a sort of obscure passage and we're all, you know, we're all just doing our best. And I would, I would encourage, you know, readers of translations not to think so hard in terms of errors in translation because sure every single translation that was ever done is statistically likely to have somewhere or other a semantic mistake in it but really the important thing about the translation is does it tell the story does it give you the author's boy you know the the hilda rossner translation of siddhartha which is full of wrong translations you know semantically wrong things that book made me deeply love hessa as a young person. And so I would say, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Right. Um, there's, there are a lot of questions and a lot of them also are kudos to you. I should mention that here. Um, people are very excited oh, about you. the project and about your work in general. And um, there's a group of questions that deal um, with your emotions during the translation process. 
And um, so how do you deal with the discomfort um, that sometimes a translation can produce, the discomfort of looking at particular words and maybe something that is yeah. untranslatable or shouldn't be translated anymore? Or um, uh, how do you deal also, uh, someone used the word in the question, translation betrayals, right? <laughs> so how do you, do, you, do you feel at times that you, uh, you know, that, 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 that translation betrays maybe the intention of the author, or is that not, not a factor for you? Whew. Well, insofar as I am not Thomas Mann, my, trans my <laughs> translation will not be the same as his book. So, you know, traitor, proud traitor, where's my proud? No, sorry, we can't say that in, in, in 2020 USA. We, we cannot say, we can't, um, traitor is not a badge of pride these days. Um, sorry, thanks for reminding me of the real world. Um, speaking of which, you know, I'm right. I'm translating a book right now that was deeply informed by trauma, by the trauma of war, the trauma of a pandemic. You know, Thomas Mann's one of his daughters had influenza. You know, so the you know he had that trauma right there in his own family, um, and I feel like you can feel that in the pages of the book. There's a, there's a, a, a sort of sadness and fraughtness and. You know, it's a very gray day in, in New York right now. Um, there's a lot of trauma going around. There's a lot of political trauma, you know. You know, if I even just start talking about Philadelphia, I might just start to cry right now. Um, these are really hard times. And, you know, this book in a way is not helping because it's, it's bringing all this very much to bear, and I, I am feeling this while I'm translating it. On the same, at the, at the other hand, it's very funny too, and Mon is finding humor and he's writing humor. And so there's that also. He's a very different person from me and he's writing from a point of view of, you know, very upper crusty, lifestyle and you kind of feel that and uh, you know i'm not that far into the book i'm still in his childhood i think i'll be feeling more of that and more of the you know rich person looking at a not rich person i i think there's probably going to be a lot more of that be before i'm done i haven't quite gotten to there and i haven't gotten to the the literally bilingual passages yet which you know, I'm still, I'm still thinking about how I'm going to handle them. At this point, I think I'm likely to keep them bilingual with a, um, the, the, the translation in an appendix, but, you know, that's work in progress. I reserve the right to change my mind. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, um, how would you handle um, maybe some, some of the uh, philosophical or scientific discourse um, for example, um, Mann's kind of racial geography that is present in the novel, you know, the East versus the West, the North, the South, and uh, uh, the science of psychoanalysis and so on. There are some questions um, that also concern, um, you know, thinking about, in a way, a, almost like a commentary or footnote apparatus to contextualize um, all of this. Or do, does it still translate without a kind of, you know, appendix, or does it, uh, you know, is there a way to to do that differently? Yeah, I do not like to use footnotes. I really don't. Things that absolutely, absolutely might require a footnote, I tend to save and incorporate into some sort of translators afterward because, you know, even in Thomas Mann's time, there were things that might have needed footnotes, you know, and that's, every book has things that might need footnotes, but I don't think he's a footnotey kind of writer in that book. So I'm not going to do that. Um, as to the, you know, the geographies um, that, that you mentioned, there's going to be a lot more research in my life before I'm done, you know, especially into the philosophical background of his book. Um, the racial material, it's going to be interesting. You know, I'm very glad that, you know, I've, I've 
for example, just attended the, the Alta Conference, which was held online, the American Literary Translators Association Conference, for those of you who don't know it, um, it was held online just these, a couple of weeks ago, and the, the talks are, um, most of the panels are still available as podcasts, so go to the, the Alta American Literary Translators Association website, but there were a few panels that, that talked a lot about the racial imaginary in translating and, you know, harm reduction vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, accurate reporting. Um, these are both very important approaches and I certainly will be thinking about these as I, as I work my way through the book. I haven't had a whole lot of that to where I am up to the book so far, but I will be thinking about that. Oh yeah, actually one did come up. Um, Man uses the word dwarf in his description of the, um, of the shipyard. Um, he's describing the massive, the massive ships that are being built by tiny workers who are swarming all over the, all over the, the ships. Um, he uses an elephant and a mammoth metaphor. I'm thinking that he was inspired by Gulliver's Travels for, in this image, but that's just my own, my own thought about that. Um, but I decided to use the word diminutive because I don't think we need the word dwarf in this passage right now, but you know, it's a work, it's a work in progress, but yeah, what does it mean? The, you know, casually thrown, thrown about metaphors that are used kind of thoughtlessly in a, in a way that can cause harm. So so for now, I came down on the harm reduction side of that equation rather than the accurate reporting side of that equation. But, you know, work in progress. I have, I'm going to um, do two more questions here from the audience. Um, and uh, the one question is um, about genre, really. Um, so does it require a different approach to translating dialogue, for example, something that is more theatrical? Uh, uh, to translating, you know, kind of the lyrical passages of the uh, of the book um, than some of the other passages. So do you do you switch gears when yeah. when there is um, you know a different genre involved? Yeah, I do, and I'm I'm a pretty loose translator. I'm a pretty loose translator of dialogue in general, I would say, because I think when it comes to dialogue, I think very much about purpose, function, you know, rhetorical strategy, what is the dialogue meant to do? And, you know, and very, very often dialogue is establishing character to, you know, how does a character speak and the way people speak in different languages, you know, if you were, if you think too much about semantic precision when translating from German to English, you're likely to come up with characters who sound much more formal than they did in the English, uh, sorry, in the German original. And so the answer to that is yes, absolutely. Then maybe um, one very like practical question, last question, um, which um, some people are quite excited about you finishing the translation already. I know this this looks like a, a long time away, <laughs> but um, people want to know about your timeline and <laughs> and they want to know when they can buy the book and um, and where where it's coming out. So you can you can plug it now. It's coming out. It's coming out from W. W. Horton. My 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 due date. Just you get a due date, just like you know somebody expecting a baby. My due date is May 2022, and that is a date that I am going to be sprinting flat out from now until then to May. And after that, you know, books like a book this size might be in production up to a year. So it may be that the book comes out in 2023. Um, we shall see. I think that's probably about the earliest the book will come out. If my publisher lets me, I'll pre-publish some little chunks, but pre-publishing is also dangerous because if you're like me, I work cyclically. I go forward and backwards and forwards and backwards and I keep reworking sections I've done before as I learn more from moving ahead in the book. And so, you know, 
I'm going to be changing the first page even as I'm working on the last page, guaranteed. Well, I'm doing my best. I'm, 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 I'm bailing out the boat. I'm, pump, I'm pumping out the boat as fast as I can. <laughs> Well, we're, we're all really looking forward to it. And um, there's, there's a lot of uh, people saying that they love the talk and they loved um, hearing you speak. Oh, and thank they you. want thank more you so literary much. talks so much. <laughs> from the American Academy. And um, so, um, so thank you so much, Susan. Thank yeah. you so much. I really appreciate the conversation. Susan, um, on behalf of the Academy, thank you so much. You know, in an era or in a, in a time of the four-year cycle when we're being bombarded with uh, words that are um, being thrown around so carelessly, it's unbelievably um, uplifting to hear words being uh, used with such care and to explain everything that, it, that goes into them. And I will never again, uh, no matter how much I say, I'll look at a bilge pump uh, in quite the same way. But uh, you have uh, really uh, given us a tremendous amount to think about and done it with uh, great wit and verve. And uh, we can't wait to get you over here. Um, so I want to thank oh, everyone. Thank you so much. Can't wait to come. Uh, I want to thank everyone uh, who uh, joined us for this uh, terrific talk. And um, since um, uh, we'll get Susan here at some point, we may have, uh, who knows, we may have the whole book to talk about. Um, but uh, let me just say in closing again, thanks to all of you who joined, all the excellent questions that were sent in, uh, including from the graduate student who said that uh, um, you were totally inspiring, Susan. And uh, let me just say that um, unfortunately we return to the mundane world of politics um, on, uh, on November 3rd, uh, there will be a, uh, um, a gathering of heads of lots of different organizations, former ambassador uh, to Germany, John Emerson, Daimler head of external affairs, Eckhart von Kleiden, um, former German minister, Christian Schmidt, and even myself uh, speaking about the election. And then two days after, uh, we'll be doing this uh, again, talking about the election in the past tense, at least we hope that it will be passed by then. Uh, and of all places, the Villa Aurora Thomas Mann House um, uh, with that wonderful organization and at the Wissenschaftszentrum uh, Berlin Social Science Center. So for a panel discussion uh, on, the, uh, on the election, uh, humbly entitled, the US presidential election and the future of democracy. I think I'd rather have Susan do this again. But um, on that note, uh, let me say uh, good night and uh, goodbye to Morningside Heights, and we'll see you again soon, I hope. Bye. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you so much, Veronica. It was Thank wonderful. You. Thank you.